Hi, this talk is about laconic private set intersection and applications. I'm Pedro, and this is joint work with Navid Alamati, Niku Dotling, Sanjam Garg, Muhammad Ajabadi, and Siang Pu. In this work, we study the framework of laconic cryptography, which is a special case of two-party secure computation. Here, the first party, or the receiver, has a long input X. It first hashes the input into a small hash H. Then the sender computes a message M depending on his input Y and the hash H. Finally, given X and M, the receiver can compute uh, F of XY. In terms of efficiency, we require that the communication complexity of the protocol doesn't depend on the size of the receiver's input X. The laconic cryptography framework allows for secure reverse delegation of computation, as opposed to fully homomorphic encryption, and allows for communication efficient secure protocols. The laconic cryptography framework was presented in the work of Sho et al., where a laconic oblivious transfer protocol is presented. This protocol can be based on several hardness assumptions, such as DDH, LWE, or QR. Later, a laconic protocol to compute any function was presented in a work of Quack et al. This protocol is based on the hardness of the LWE with super polynomial modulus to noise ratio. Both of these works use non black box techniques, which makes both schemes impractical for real world applications. This raises two questions. The first one is whether we can build laconic protocols for other functionalities from, from assumptions other than LWE. The second one is whether we can build efficient laconic protocols. In this work, we focus on laconic protocols for a specific functionality, namely private set intersection. Here, the receiver has a large input set X and the sender has a small input set Y. In the end of the protocol, the receiver should learn the intersection of both sets and nothing else. So what do we know about laconic private set intersection? We know that laconic function evaluation implies laconic PSI, but at the cost of super polynomial modulus to noise ratio LWE and non black box techniques. Hence, we ask two questions in this work. The first one is whether laconic PSI can be based on assumptions other than LWE. The second one is whether we can build efficient laconic PSI protocols. Our results are twofold. We start by presenting a feasibility result. Namely, we construct the LPSI from anonymous hash encryption, which can be based on CDH or LWE, and garbled circuits. This construction builds on the Merkle tree garbled circuit based approach of Dotling et al. Showing how to use garbled circuits to perform binary search on a set of sorted values. The construction uses non black box techniques. So, as our second contribution, we present a laconic PSI protocol from Phi Hiding which uses only black box techniques. Then, we show how to extend the Phi Hiding construction into a reusable LPSI, where the first message of the receiver can be reused across several executions of the protocol and which is secure against malicious senders. We do this by relying on the decisional composite residuosity assumption, the Phi Hiding assumption, and the subgroup decisional assumption on pairings. As an additional result, we construct black box designated verifier NISX for range proofs for Damgard Uric ciphertexts. This allows us to prove that the plain text of a DJ ciphertext is within a certain range. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the black box LPSI from Phi Hiding. For a detailed description and analysis of our feasibility result, please check the full version of the paper. We now describe our construction based on the phi hiding assumption. Our starting point is the construction of Goyal et al. for one-way functions with encryptions from phi hiding. Recall that 
in a one-way function with encryption given age which is uh, the result of a one-way function applied to a string of bits x the encryptor can encrypt a message with respect to a position i and the bit b the decryptor can recover m if and only if xi is equal to b otherwise the message m remains hidden in the one-way function with encryption by Goyal et al., the CRS is composed by an RSA modulus n and by two L uh, uniformly chosen prime numbers. To compute the one-way function on an input string x, we first choose a random element r and compute g to the r times the product of the primes pi xi modulo n. Given h, a position i star and a bit p, the encryptor first chooses a random element rho and computes a ciphertext which is g to the rho times p i star b. Then it uses as the shared key the value h to the rho modulo n. Finally, the decryptor computes a key k prime, which is the uh, ciphertext to the uh, product of the primes p i x i for i different than i star. It is easy to see that if xi prime is equal to b, then k prime is equal to k. Our first observation is that this scheme almost yields a laconic PSI scheme, as we'll see in the next slide. Let's see how we can build a laconic PSI protocol using the ideas from the previous slide. Let's assume for now that we have a universe of polynomial size. We'll, we will later explain how we can remove this, uh, um, this, uh, this uh, condition. The CRS is composed by an RSA modulus, an element G in the multiplicative group uh, uh, Zn star, and primes P1, Pl, each one encoding uh, an element in the universe. Let's assume that the receiver has a set SR and that the sender has a set uh, S, S with only one element. The receiver starts by computing a hash value H, which is computed as G to the R times the products PI for each I in SR. Then the sender computes um, an element F, which is G to the row times uh, uh, PW, which is a prime encoding the element W, and a value r which is a randomness extractor applied to uh, the hash value h to the row. It sends the um, randomness extractor seed s, the value f and the value r to the receiver. Now for each element in the receiver set the receiver computes a value ri which is the extractor applied to f to the r times the product of the primes encoding uh, the receiver set element except for the ith position. If there, if there is an element i such that the value ri is equal to r, then the receiver outputs uh, the uh, set element i. It is easy to see that the uh, uh, protocol is correct and laconic in the sense that the communication complexity of the protocol doesn't depend on the size of the receiver set. However, there is a drawback in this uh, protocol. Namely, uh, it only works for uh, polynomial size universes and is only secure against a semi-honest standard. Now let's see how we can prove semi-honest security of... Security against a semi-honest standard is trivial since the value h in th is indistinguishable from a uniform value. For security against a semi-honest receiver, we first re replace the uh, RSA modulus in the CRS by, uh, an RSA mo by a, a, a value n such that pw divides phi of n. This change goes unnoticed under the phi hiding assumption. Now we can argue that the value f, which is g to the row times pw, loses information about rho. This means that the value h to the row has high mean entropy, and thus we can replace r by a uniform value. 
Now we can change the uh, uh, RSA modulus back to the normal mode. And we can conclude that uh, uh, and uh, we can replace f by a uniform value. We now show the main ideas uh, to uh, extend this uh, protocol into a protocol that supports exponential universes. The main idea is to describe uh, the uh, universe implicitly via a PRF key. This PRF should map into the prime numbers. But recall that in the security proof for a semi-honest receiver, we need to program one of the primes to uh, use the phi hiding assumption. For that, we'll use a programmable PRF in which we can program one of the outputs of the PRF. We now show the main ideas on how to extend the protocol to allow for malicious uh, sender. Recall that to prove uh, security against a malicious sender, we need to extract the sender's input. For this, we can use general purpose NISX to um, guarantee that the receiver's uh, message is well formed, but this uh, uses non-black box techniques. So observe that the, uh, uh, that the sender's message is composed by the value f, which is g to the rho times pw, and the value r, which is the extractor applied to h to the rho. To prove malicious sender security, we need to extract both the values w and rho. The high-level idea to extract both uh, w and rho is the following. We first perform a re-encryption step, which allows the simulator to extract the sender's input w. Then we switch to a damgard Yuri group, and this allows to extract both uh, uh, the value raw PW and check that R is indeed well formed. Finally, we show how to construct range-proof uh, uh, range proof, proof systems for uh, damgard Yuri ciphertext, and this guarantees that the uh, simulator can extract the value uh, with, high, with overwhelming probability. Let's Let's first look at the re-encryption re step. Here, the observation is that the value R, computed by the sender, is uniform when uh, the element is not in the receiver set. In the original protocol, the sender computes the value F and the value R and sends both of them to the receiver. The receiver then checks if there's an, uh, an I, such that RI is equal to R and outputs uh, the element I uh, if the, if this happens for for uh, for some for some element, we now modify the protocol in the following way. We had a we had a public key of an NCPA uh, public key encryption to the uh, to the CRS for which the simulator has the secret key. Then the sender sends the value f as before, but now it sends a ciphertext which encrypts uh, his uh, input. Uh, element w with the randomness r. The receiver computes ri as before for uh, all elements in his set and it checks if uh, the encryption of the value of, this, of the uh, set element i with randomness ri corresponds is the same as the uh, ciphertext sent by the sender. In the security proof the simulator now has the uh, secret key for the public key and can decrypt the ciphertext sent by the sender and recover the, uh, the uh, sender's input W. As a bonus, we get perfect correctness for our new protocol. And security against the, uh, uh, the receiver, we can simply, um, since R is uniform, we can simply replace the uh, ciphertext by encryptions of zero. Now, for, to prove security against a malicious sender, the simulator, since it has the secret key of the public key, can extract W uh, from the ciphertext, as I mentioned before. But there's still an issue, which is the following. The simulator does not detect false positives. For example, consider the case where a malicious sender encrypts using a, 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 a uniform value R instead of computing it honestly. In this case, the simulator will extract the sender's input, but uh, the honest receiver 
might uh, uh, will fail with high probability. So to fix this, we need a way to extract the randomness row from the value f, from the value f. Our, our solution for this is simple. We simply replace the uh, multiplicative group of Zn by a Damgard-Udic group. Recall that Damgard-Udic groups have a very nice property, which is the following. Given phi of n, we can efficiently compute discrete logarithms. Let's see how we can use this fact about DJ groups to prove security against malicious senders. Assume for now that we have a reusable designated verifier NISIC, which given f, which is g to the a, allows us to show that the, the uh, exponent a is within some range. For a complete description of such a scheme, please see the full version of our paper. Let's see how the final version of our protocol looks like. Now, all parties compute their uh, values in the DJ group. The sender now sends F and the ciphertext CT as before, but additionally proves that uh, the uh, uh, exponent in, in G to the row PW is within some range. For security against the malicious sender, we can replace the, the element G by an element uh, G2 for which we can for each the simulator can compute uh, D logs. The simulator can now recover a row times PW and perform the re-encryption step as before. To show the uh, usefulness of laconic private set intersection, we show that we can use laconic PSI to construct a new primitive that we call self-detecting encryption. Self-detecting encryption is essentially a public key encryption such that we can detect if a ciphertext is encrypting a special message. Let's see how we can build self-detecting encryption from laconic PSI. First, an authority, such as a government, publishes a hash of the uh, special database, which can be, exam for example, composed by uh, illegal videos. Then ciphertexts are um, uh, encrypted as uh, with respect to this hash. That is, ciphertext corresponds to the sender's message in the LPSI. Pro in the LPSI. Finally, anyone knowing the uh, database can perform a private set intersection between the database and the ciphertext. If the ciphertext is encrypting a, mes a message which is in the database, then we learn the message. Otherwise, we, we, we learn nothing about the uh, encrypted message. That's all. Thanks.